so many people out there today.
When is the, when's the last time you fell on your knees because of what Christ has done? Think about that in that song. Falling on our knees because of what Christ has done. What an incredible, incredible thought, isn't it? Well, folks, before you sit down to turn on, give each other the wave. We've got to give the wave because we can't give the hugs. Say hi to each other. When, when you're all done waving and kissing and air hugging, sit on down. That's the best we can do. Who is that unmasked man? Arrest him. It's good to see you here today. It's good to be here today. Like Danielle said, it's good to have a few more faces showing up. Wearing those masks. I still like your face even with a mask. Even with a mask, I'll take it. Well, today's message is not going to be a Christmas message. Now, just so you all know, if you weren't on the Thursday night Zoom session we had, uh, I was rebuked by the church. Yes, I was rebuked, and, and, and I do submit this is not a Christmas message. I am sorry. I understand there's a petition going around for next year to have three to four Christmas messages before this. I even signed the petition, okay? Okay, and, and I'm not complaining about those who said things about the message. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. I'm not going to talk about Amory and Mark at all, <laughs> or Dan. Oh, no. Hey, but today is not a Christmas message. But it, it's a message, and, and I think it's an important message to have. And we're going to continue in, 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 our, in our, our, our trip through Ephesians. It's called The Failure to Communicate. Communication is important. And it's a quote I'd like us to start off with, with, it, with, this, uh, with this message about the failure to communicate when we look at this. This quote is light versus darkness. Words which do not, do not give the light of Christ increase darkness. Words which do not give the light of Christ increase darkness by Mother Teresa. That's quite a quote. I like that quote. Communication is the sending and receiving of information from one another. That's what it is. And it can be in a lot of different ways. It can be verbal. It can be written. I've got it written down right here, right? And it can be body language. Facial expressions. I get it. You know, I can't see a lot of facial expressions anymore, but we can still do it. We still squint and do things. You can up your eyebrow or something. We still communicate. But the root word for communication is communicare from the Latin. Yeah, we're going to get a language lesson today. What it means is to have things in common, which is interesting. Communication, we have something in common with one another. We have communicated. We've done this. Now, we send emails and texts, don't we, all the time now, emails and texts. We have autocorrect in there. Autocorrect is good. Autocorrect can be a little bit, eh, sometimes. It can really change the meaning of your words. In fact, I was sending out a couple of weeks ago this, uh, 
email from the uh, Thursday night uh, prayer requests that we did. And as you can see, uh, you know, Joanne is not here today. Joanne is in the Philippines. And in the prayer request, in that was, let Joanna have peace about traveling to the Philippines and getting there. Okay, that's what it was. And I put it out there. And when I was writing the email that came up, I spelled Philippines wrong. <sighs> Imagine that. And it corrected it. And I said, oh, that's what it is. And I accepted it. I didn't proofread it twice. So I said, let, let Joanna have peace going to Philippians. And of course, someone had to point that out to me too. I'm not going to mention Joe's name. But that got pointed. But the point being, when we communicate, we need to do a lot of proofreading. We need to proof what we're saying. And when we speak, we need to proof what we're saying. Proof what we're saying, right? What does it say in James? Be slow to speak. We need to know what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. We need to slow down. In Colossians, it says, let your speech always be seasoned, let your, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know, you may know how you ought to answer one another. Let there be grace in our speech. Don't you wish there always was? Seasoned with salt. Salt's what you use to purify and preserve. Salt's an amazing chemical out there. A little sodium chloride, I tell you what, it's amazing what salt can do. In prayer, prayer is communication, right? I can pray for you, we can pray together. In either case, we're speaking to God, we're communicating. Okay. We should look for God to speak to us. But the key way that God speaks to us is through Scripture. Because God's told us a whole lot, folks. This book is got some, it's got some weight to it, okay? God speaks to us through Scripture. We can't always trust those thoughts that pop into our minds, can we? You're praying about something, and you get a thought right away. Ah, that's the answer. That's it. That's from God right away. I'm good. Because we can sort of be self-deceiving at times. We can have a thought come into our mind. That's what we want the answer to be. It might not be the answer that God has for us. It's important. It says in Matthew 6, 8, it says, For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Ever think of that? God knows what we need before we ask. And it's interesting. When we're waiting on God for an answer, think about this for a moment. You're waiting on God for an answer. You're praying about something. You're not going with the first thing that pops into your mind. All of a sudden, your attention is on God, right? You're focused on God. Isn't that good? Because that's what God wants to do. We don't need an instant answer. Not only that, during that time frame, you can see that God is answering prayers that aren't even asked yet because he knows what our needs are before that. So we're going to read our text, and we're going to see the impact of communication that we have today. And sometimes our communication is a failure. And it's not a failure the way we might think of, and this text is going to discuss that. Sometimes it's a failure, right? I just, you know, I'm speaking to my wife or not speaking to my wife, and we have a failure to communicate. But it's a little bit different this, in our text that we're going to look at, this failure. So we're, we're going to be in Ephesians 5, 1 to 7. We've gone through a lot of this already, but we need to take a whole bite of the entire text. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering, a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you as fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an adulterer has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your scripture, Lord. It's how you speak to us. Please help us, Lord, to see how we need to be obedient to what you've already told us, Lord, to be obedient and how you graciously are caring for us all the time. Let us be aware of this, Lord. You're answering our prayers before we even put them up to you. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Tough scripture, huh? Not exactly a Christmas message. It's okay. You're going to get one next week. Next week, it's going to be come and see. 
Okay? You even got the title. Promise. Christmas. Next week. This week, straight up word of God. So there's four points we have to this message I'd like to go through. Four points I would like to communicate if I can. The first one is unfit communication. The second one is discontentment. The third one is church community. And the last one's everyone's favorite, idolatry, right? Everyone wants to talk about idolatry. Great topic. Well, let's start off with our first point, unfit communication. In verses, in verses uh, 3 and 4, it said, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints. Now we get neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So in verses 3 and 4, okay, there's a, there's a, it completes a thought of, not, of things that are not fitting for saints. Verses 3, verse 3 talks about the actual actions of fornication and covetousness. Those are the actions. Verse 4 is a descriptor of how one gets to the actions of verse 3. It describes communications relevant to a person that will lead to unfit actions. This is all just in the verses 3 and 4. It's one complete thought. But we need to define some terms here. We need to understand what we're talking about. So let's define them. Filthiness. Let's start off with, the first, let's start with filthiness. This is a fun topic, huh? We need to go through these things. This isn't the word of God. That's why we do this. That's why we do this. Filthiness denotes indecency, obscenity, or wantonness. Not merely in speech, but in anything. Filthiness is opposed to purity. So what happens? Your children, it's dinner time, right? The children come to the table. <laughs> their faces are filthy. Their hands are filthy. They just are. They don't care. They don't know better. They're going to eat. They're going to put it in their mouths. They don't care. You go clean up. You're filthy. You tell them that. But it's unfitting for filthiness to come out of the mouth of a saint. See, because we as saints, we know better. And foolish. A fool is not someone who is mentally deficient, but rather someone who is morally deficient because he or she ignores the word of God. That's what a fool is. A fool is someone who is morally deficient. In, in this context, Paul is referring to speech that disregards or makes light of God's moral commands. That's what we're talking about here. Foul speech, silly talk. It means I take something that's shameful and make it appear acceptable by adding humor to it. That's what it is. Foolish or silly speech has no point except to give an air of Dirty worldliness. That's what foolish speech does. And coarse jesting. There's three means of communication. Coarse jesting. I got this little definition, and I like it because I like what it says. It says, it turns witticisms in a vulgar sense. I like it because I love the word witticisms. It's not a word we use too often, is it? Witticisms. The idea is that a person turns easily or makes quick comebacks with clever words having a double meaning. The meaning of the comeback is obscene or suggestive, making it vulgar. Ergo, we get turns witticisms in a vulgar sense. That's what coarse jesting does. Coarse jesting is speaking to someone, usually of the opposite sex, in this context. Coarse jesting, there's a hidden agenda. Coarse jesting is baiting a person to see how they react. We need to be honest, I think. Uh, of course, Jesse is testing the water to see how they're going to react, but we need to be honest about dirty jokes and off-color comments. When we use these, these commentaries, when we use those, it proves that one is not that funny and that one's intent is dishonorable, according to God. Reflect for a moment why these ungodly attributes may need to be spelled out in such detail. Because the communications from our mouths is a perfect way back up into verse 3, which is fornication. And this is trolling. This is trolling. Not like they talk about on the internet, trolling for things. This is trolling like going fishing on a boat. If you ever gone fishing on a boat, it's fun. You get on a boat, you get on the boat, and you start driving around the boat slow, you put some bait on a hook, it goes behind the boat, 
You sit there and you wait for a fish to bite your bait. Trolling is fun. It's lazy. It's great. And uh, you might catch a fish. You might not. If it's a nice day, you don't care. It's very hit or miss. That's what trolling is. Our conversation, both our words and our lifestyle, cannot be identified with filthy, foolish speech or coarse jesting. Why? What is this? Because that is trolling. Filthy and foolish speech coupled with coarse jesting is seeing if we'll get a bite on our line. If we can reel someone in for our own devices. That's what it's about, folks. Look at the context of this speech, where it's found. It's embedded in a warning against fornication and covetousness. It's right there with it. This communication is not fitting, but I think it's the easiest way or the last ditch effort for people to try and fit in. But here's the point. People want to belong. People want to belong. We all want to belong somewhere. And we're not always accepted. So what will happen is, even if it's a decadent scenario, but you're accepted, you can belong to it, you'll throw away all your standards and be part of that. And I think this is incredibly sad. Because we've got these two front doors here that open up wide. You know, we, we could be into a situation where I have to tell you, well, folks, we have too many people in the room, so with the 11 o'clock service, guess what? I need half of you to leave, and at 12.30, I'll redo the message. And then if need be at 3.30, I'll redo the message. I could do that. Until I lose my voice, I keep speaking. My point being is that this is a place where you could belong. Yet people are out there, and they'll gravitate to the most decadent parts of society just to belong and degrade themselves. I find that very, very sad. But that's what the world accepts. And that's not acceptable in the life of a believer. It's not. In Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said, when he's speaking to the Pharisees, as you can well imagine, brood of vipers. <laughs> Jesus really laid into him, didn't he? Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Words are important, folks, because they reveal our hearts. They just do. Words reveal our hearts. They really do. Now, this text here, exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees, he just, had, he just performed a miracle. They accused him of being of Satan. Yeah, that's what he did. Jesus says to him, how can you claim to know God when your mouths, when, when by your mouth, evil, the evil of your heart is revealed? He's saying to him, you're the godly ones? Really? You're godly? Have you listened to your mouth? Have you heard what you're saying? Likewise, how can you and I that believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths who Jesus is? The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is resident in you because you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. So how can we ever speak evil? We need to take a check here. We need to think about this. Does that thought come to our mind? I think it should. But Paul's letter here to the Ephesians, I want you to understand, it is not a rebuke. This is a warning and an admonition. This is an edification, okay? There is no indication that this sin was in their church, okay? This is not like he was writing to the uh, church in Corinth that had a lot of sexual sin in it. No, the Ephesian church, they seemed to be doing well, and he'd been with them for three years. He had helped them out. The point is, this entire gamut of activity is not fitting for saints and cannot be found in the church. And the church, once again, I'll always say, is the church is not these four walls. This is the building, folks. We're the church. We are the church. We are the church, okay? As each individual's in each individual's life, as we walk out this door at 1217, we are the church. When we go out that door, are we a lighthouse? Are we a lighthouse? See, this, this message, this text, though, it's very hard. It's actually good and healthy. It reinforces some things with us. We need to have things reinforced to us, don't we? You're going to cross the street? Be sure to look both ways. Common sense. We need to know about our communication, how we communicate, and how we might fail sometimes. And we can do something about it. But we cannot conduct our lives in avoidance either. You cannot live your life in avoidance of sin. 
It's too much energy, it's too much effort. It just is. You just can't do it. I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this. That makes me tired. Trying to constantly be vigilant to, vigilant to avoid sin is too much work. Our walk has to change. That's what this text is about, the walk of love. This is what we're in here. Walking behind the Savior is being a disciple. It's being a follower, okay? And you're walking there. That's not avoiding potholes. The path is clear because we're behind Christ. He is the light, and he lights our path. Of course, jesting is part of our character. We're looking for satisfaction on a road that's really going to be kind of bumpy. It's not fitting. Example, you know, I did not wear a suit today, okay? I used to put this, I should have wore a suit. Why? You'll see why. But I buy a new suit about once a decade, and I'm a little bit behind. January is coming. I'm going to have a new suit. You're going to say, please, when I get the suit, even if you don't like it, say, Pete, that's a nice looking suit. Okay. Make me feel good. I'm going to spend a couple hundred bucks on myself. All right? But when I go shopping and I get a new suit, I'm a 40 regular. It's easy. I'm a 40 regular. Now, when I put on, get the pants, they need to be hemmed. 33-inch inseam, okay, it's easy, I know this, that's my, that's my suit size. So I need just a few alterations done to my suit. If you put me into a 48, I'll be swimming in it. If you put me into a 36, I'm going to look silly, the buttons will be popping off. Hi, I'm pink, you know, I'll look ridiculous. That's what I'll look like. But when I get a suit, it needs to fit right. The suit needs to fit. If it doesn't, I won't be comfortable standing here in front of you. I won't be content. It needs to fit. And something's wrong if my communication is filthy, foolish, and has coarse jesting in it. Of course, jesting in it. You see, if that's in me, I need an alteration, just like my suit does. I need to change. I'm to imitate, imitate Christ. If so, why is foolish speech in my lexicon? It shouldn't be there. Why foolish? Why do we have this foolishness in there? The second point is, I think, discontentment. Discontentment. Because these traits that we're discussing here are the nature of a person that's discontent, is what they are. It tells us in, back, in verse 4, it says, For neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. So the text says, but rather giving thanks. That's 180 degrees turnabout, right? About face, giving thanks regarding our conduct and our communication. The antidote to these vices, if you want to call them, I, I'm trying to put them into a new category of the, these three things, is gratitude. When a person's thankful, they're content. They're not discontent. This but that we see in verse 4, but, but rather give thanks, that's a no to the previously stated traits that are there. To that unsatisfied condition, driven by what? Driven by covetousness. That's what it's driven by. If you're overflowing with the thanksgiving of God, then you're not dominated or driven by discontentment. Discontentment is a driver. There's a lot of discontentment in this world, and sometimes people are looking for something to be discontent about just to drive them. Well, I don't have anything to be discontent about. We don't, we're sitting in a pretty comfortable room right now. What are we going to be discontent about? We should have gratitude. What's gratitude? Gratitude is what you feel when you believe God is for you and not against you. Gratitude feels, is there when you know someone has your back. Do we think in our minds, how, when's the last time we thought, well, God's for me, he's not against me? Do we think that way? You know, I was writing this message, and on Wednesday morning, I received a text, Wednesday morning, from Gabe Solis. Some of you might know Gabe. Gabe grew up in this church. He lives in New Hampshire now. He's a cool guy. I love Gabe. And Gabe was doing his morning devotions, and he just texted me, Pete, I want you to know that I was praying for you today. I haven't heard from Gabe in six months. Seven, I don't know, a long time. I just wanted to know I was praying for you. I was like, that's cool. And I text back to Gabe. You know, we do the text thing, right? Gabe, thanks. I'm just doing this section on thankfulness in my message right now. And I, I went blah, 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 blah. You know, how you do, can do it in a text, right? 
and I did that, and uh, describing it to him. And Gabe says this, I guess God just wanted to confirm all of this to you. Isn't that cool? That was his response. I'm talking about thankfulness, and he just said, yeah, God just wanted to be sure that you knew this thankfulness was important. You know, you don't get those kind of aha moments too often, do you? I got, I am writing the section on thankfulness, and the text came in about 7 a.m. in the morning. It's no surprise that thankfulness is lacking in the world, but it's a travesty if unthankfulness is found in, this ch in the church among us. In Ephesians 4.22, it says, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. An eviction needs to happen in our lives. It really does. An expulsion of something must happen. Our former lusts. The old man needs to leave, and he leaves completely. What happens when, when, when children are in school, and they will be in school again, trust me, a little bit more, but when they get into school, they get in trouble sometime, don't they? As the expression goes, boys will be boys, and they'll get into a scuffle, they'll be in the principal's office, and what's the principal left to do? They, get, they got no choice. You're both expelled. They get kicked out for three days. And what happens between countries? Well, one country gets upset with another country. I'm going to, I'll kick out your diplomats. They're expelled. They're kicked out. That's what happens. That's what we do. Well, thankfulness would have the Ephesians putting off the old man, expel him, and the deceitful lusts they were embedded in. And it's no different with, uh, with, with us. And this is what is fitting. The communication traits of filthy and foolish speech and coarse jesting is unacceptable. And sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman is sexual immorality, as we said last week. That's what it is. This whole thing of discontentment. Tough question, so I'll put it to myself. If I'm struggling with the, with the traits of filthy, foolish talk and coarse jesting, why am I so discontent? You can ask yourself that own question. Why am I so discontent that I have these in my life? Why is my heart moved by the filthy and not by not ingratitude? Think about that. See, this text, when you dig into it, really digs in. It really digs in. Is filthy fun? Why? Why? We have the privilege of believers that should follow in practice. We have doctrine as believers that should result in duty. We have revelation as believers that should result in responsibility. My responsibility is to go make disciples. That's what, Bob, that's what Jesus told his disciples. We have belief as believers that should result in behavior, behavior that is fitting. We have the word of God that should result in the walk of a Christian, a walk of love. So we need to ask ourselves, who's are we? Who do we belong to? Who is our father? This is so important. Now, if unfit communication plagues you, I want to encourage you first and foremost, go to God in vigorous prayer. Go to God first in vigorous prayer. Pray about it. And when you're there to a point, then get together with your brothers and sisters. But go to God first. Don't go to me first. Go to God. Then come to me. Let's start with God. I'm a man, guys. I am so flawed, OK? Start with God and then go to your brothers and sisters. This is so important. Third point I'd like to discuss, because I think it's so important in Ephesus, is church community. He said in verses 5 to 7, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. So Paul is clear here, and he says in verse 5, you know this. You know this. Remember, Paul had been with them for three years in Ephesus as he writes this letter to them. This is not new information. This is not like, oh, I shouldn't be filthy. <laughs> no, 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 no. They knew this. They knew this. The Ephesians knew that pursuing fornication being sexually immoral 
was not walking in love. The person coveting or having an unnatural appetite for what others have, in particular outside of marriage, was not walking in love. This is lust. It is not love. Now, the Ephesians were a very closely knit community. They were. See, they knew what was happening in each other's lives. You know, they had to be supportive, just like if you recall in the book of Acts, okay? In the book of Acts, they got to one point where, you know, the Christian church had to support itself, right? And, and what happened was those that were more affluent, that had lands, they sold what they had. And they took those funds, they put it at the feet of the apostles, and the apostles distributed it as was needed. They were into each other's life. They laid it all on the line. There was nothing left. They laid it all on the line. Any part of the body that was in need, the, other, the rest of the body was going to take care of them. Because the body always knows what's happening throughout it, doesn't it? Now, there's an exception to that. And we see it in the Bible. And that was lepers. Leprosy. It's an amazing thing when you start looking at leprosy and what it was. Leprosy was a disease. There was, there was no cure for it at that time. And, and, and it caused the loss of body parts. Why? Well, disease got a hold of you. It had something called a peripheral neuropathy. It means that the extremities of your body loses sensation. You could no longer feel the extremities of your body. So there you are. I'm a leper, and I hurt my foot. But I can't feel my foot, so I don't take care of my foot. An infection sets in, maybe a little gangrene. There goes my little toe. There goes the toe next to it. I don't know the names of all the toes. I know the big toe and the little piggy toe. That's about it. The point being is you start losing body parts if you're a leper. That's what happens. The leper cannot properly care for his or her body at this time. It's so true. This can never be the case in the church. See, this church in Ephesus, they were emerging out of a quagmire of decadence. Think where this church was coming out of, okay? They understood the need for purity, and they understood the need to care, to care for one another. And they had, this was communicated between them. They lived close together. They had a great interdependence. In thinking of that, I ask you, do we have that interdependence between us? Do we as a church have that interdependence between us? We care for orphans. We're doing a good job. We got the Christmas tree over here. We're raising funds. I think we already got a grand you know, before Christmas. We'll send it down to them or something to the Children's Lighthouse Homes. We're supposed to take care of orphans. We will. We'll do what we can. That's money. Turns out that's easy because we're really affluent. <laughs> Folks, we got money, honey. We got money. The rest of the world would die to have our money. We have money, okay? But think about it. We're dispersed all week long. We don't see each other. We, don't, we live in Boston and Dedham and Norwood and Walpole and da 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 We're dispersed. I have a distinct advantage because I go visit people. Now as people become more comfortable, I go visit them. It's cool. I love visiting people. Okay, And if I haven't gotten to you yet, I will. I love to go visit people. But are we co 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 cohesive like this church was? Is that our goal? Or is it, does it take adversity to make everything aware to us? Adversity, we should be aware of it. But those other times, do we know in general what's happening in each other's lives? Is our collective knowledge of the needs of our church constrained to the short prayer request lists that are emailed out after every Thursday night Bible study. Is that as much as we know about each other? That's what I'd like you to think about. Because if that's as much you know about each other, I think we need to communicate better. Wouldn't you say that? I would. This section of text is important on the function, ongoing functionality of a church. Sure, we're to keep sin out. Sin, we want to keep sin out. I get it. I want to keep sin out of my life, folks. Trust me, I do. But the walk of love that we're supposed to have requires us to love someone. We are required to love someone, as many as you want. And the Ephesians understood this. Now, our church, we're inclusive of everyone. When you come through the doors, you're welcomed in. You want Dimitri's out there to meet him right now. If someone comes through, Dimitri's going to meet him. He's going to get him in here. OK? They're going to come in. They're a sinner. Guess what? Everyone in this room is a sinner. They're coming into good company. Is that a good thing? We're all sinners? I don't know. Think about that. At any rate. But uh, we're all sinners. Come on down. Come on in. 
Now, sin is what we want to exclude. I get that. And it's not excluded by walking through those doors, by the way. There are Christian groups out there, okay, big ones, that if you walk through a particular door of their facility, your sins are forgiven. I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Pretty big group out there. They believe in this. But it's by hearing the word of God and trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ that sin debt was paid for us on the cross. Or as Henry said in the Sunday school lesson today, he was absorbing God's wrath for us. He absorbed God's wrath for us. That's serious stuff. This church community here, church community needs to be a lighthouse. We're not to be exclusive, we're to be inclusive. Our communication, by our walk of love, is how God's work gets done and how it happens by anyone coming through the door. It needs to be of love. And when we go out of here, it needs to be of love. And this last point I like to talk about is idolatry. Really a happy little topic, isn't it? Idolatry, huh? But it's in our text. There's a whole lot more in our text, folks. I had to keep dropping stuff out. This, this, these, these verses have so much information in them, it can go on and on. But idolatry, and as we look at these verses, we need to see what they say, not what we want them to say. Because sometimes, sometimes it really seems hard what God says. You say, really? Really, God, it's that way? Yeah, it is. Uh, these activities of fornication and covetousness identify a person as an idolater. That's what it says. Communications of filthy, foolish speech and coarse jesting is an indicator of this issue. Verses 3 and 4. I'm just telling you what it says. Idolatry was serious. Idolatry is serious. Idolatry is when we worship something created which is in direct opposition to the worship of the creator, God. That's what idolatry is. Let's break it down. Let's keep it simple. When's the last time you or I, I don't know how often you do, when's the last time I ever thought about any of my activities might be idolatrous? I bet if we thought about it, we could think about it. We'd get to it, right? Perhaps you might even think of when it comes to idolatry. Comes, you might think, idolatry? Well, boy, that's an archaic thought process. Idolatry? This is 2020, almost 2021. Uh, we are pretty sophisticated. All right? Okay? That's a problem if we think that way. I'm going to tell you right now. Because we might think that we're above idolatry. And that's not a place we want to be. Idolatry can fit into any one of our lives in many different ways. In Colossians it says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, fornication, that's off there, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Hey, the Ephesians, they walked in idolatry. They lived in one of the most idolatrous cities in the world, in Ephesus, Temple Diana. It, idol worship was everywhere. This, it, was the, it was the soup du jour. Idol worship, it was a good thing. Everyone loved it. You know, that's because you didn't know the difference. You didn't know the difference. They sinned. They became followers of Christ. They became followers of Christ. Christ was sort of clearing the way, you know, like, like a snowplow. We get a big snowstorm, which I hope we don't get any. You get behind that snowplow, that snowplow clears the way for you. You feel a little bit safer. You go slower, but you get to your destination. But with being a follower of Christ doesn't mean we're not going to sin again. As I said, everyone here is a sinner. But Christians cannot habitually pursue these activities anymore and call themselves Christians. Oh, you can't. You can pursue covetousness, you can pursue fornication, you can have these attributes in your communication. You can say what you want all you want, but you're in conflict with the word of God. It's self-deception, folks. It's self-deception. It cannot be. It cannot be. Verse 5 says, there's no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God for those pursuing fornication and covetousness. It's something we need to come out of, like they did in Ephesus. They came out of it. This text says there's no inheritance for the walk of darkness. 
a walk of a distinctive lifestyle, a habit, who a person is. Our walk is who we are. Whose are we? Are we Christ's or am I Pete's? The path of disobedience is to be avoided. We imitators of Christ cannot walk that path. We need to read this text for what it says, not what we want it to say. You know, regardless of how much we may want someone to believe, a verbal statement of faith that is real will result in a radically changed lifestyle. Think about that for a moment. Your lifestyle will change when you have faith in Christ. In 1 Corinthians it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. I can say the right things all day long. Purity peaked, glad to meet, right? But if I don't have love, if I'm not really in Christ, I'm just a noisemaker. It's about that love, that love that will be in me because of that. And in Romans, this is a phenomenal verse in Romans chapter, chapter 10. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, this, this, this is a great, great set of verses. You will be saved. For man believes with his heart, and so is justified. He confesses with his lips, so he's saved. That's salvation. It comes from our mouth, but it needs to change in our heart. When this happens, a person is saved. When we trust Christ, we believe. When we confess him with our mouths. But let's not deceive ourselves. Trust in Christ will bring a change in a person's life. The fruits of the Spirit will be evident. And I'm not saying that we determine if someone can or can't be saved. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I'm not saying that we monitor people's activities to see if they're spiritually walking correctly. No, no. That's impossible. Only gods can see a person's heart, okay? That, that's not our job. That's not our, our job is to be lights. Our job is to make disciples, okay? I believe the time limit for a person's salvation is up to their last breath. I don't know how else to put it. I can't see a person's heart. I don't know God's plan. I believe it's up to a person's last breath. Maybe they're in a hospital room and something happens and they get saved then and the doctors and nurses around them are imp impacted. You can do any scenario you want, but I know it's not up to me. But we do need to love them, but not be partakers in the simple acts of someone to validate a friendship. That's condoning sin. And if we do that, that's injuring a person because we need to be light and dark. Light and dark. We cannot be gray. If we're gray, we're going to leave people confused. We're to be lighthouses. Think about our actions. Everyone has been in a setting, we all have, where filthy, foolish talk is going on in coarse jesting. It just happens. This is life. What do you do? What a bother. What do you do? <laughs> right? Oh, I don't want to make a scene. I don't want to do this. I don't want that. You know? Well, the easiest thing is just to get up and leave. Be cool about it. You know? Just get up and leave. Say, excuse me, and leave. You know, and I, th I think I told you this story a while ago, but I'm going to repeat it because it comes up because of this text. A couple years ago, I was at Home Depot. I'm down Hope, Home Depot, I'm in the doors and windows section there, and a couple of guys are waiting on me. It's cool, we're waiting, hanging out. You know, we're, we're leaning on the counters like this, you know, like guys do. We lean on counters. And the get, you know, like young guy, I don't know, 24 years old, I don't know how old he was, he whips out his phone. And he starts, he pulls up a picture of his girlfriend. And he starts showing her to me and talking about her. For real, Home Depot. Filthy, foolish talk, right? So, you know, you, you, you need a second, you need to go, uh, 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 you know, you had to get, you get to get up to speed what's happening sometimes. And I did, I quick, it was good. And I go, oh, excuse me, I go, hey, listen, you know what, I'm married, and uh, I love my wife. You know, God gave me my wife, and, and I love her very much. I don't, I don't look at pictures of other women and things like that. Awkward moment, huh? Yeah, it was awkward. And there's two of them. So one guy's like 24, the other guy's like 34. We're there. We're doing this. But I was cool about it. I wasn't going to go off on him. But light and darkness, right? What am I going to do? I wasn't going to leave because 
You know those times when you just say, I got to do something. I mean, and it works. And it, I, don't you love those times? Those times I was like, do something. And I did. I started speaking with them. Hey, guys, you know, let's talk about this. You know, relationships are really important. And I went on to a little dialogue with them and stuff. And you could see the tension. You know, people tight. And you could see them sort of relax. The body language. And it was all done. And we got done shaking hands. Hey, cool. See you guys later. Hope to see you around. Now, what came of that, I don't know. A seed was planted. But I'll tell you one thing about these, these poor gentlemen. They were living in Ephesus. That's where they lived. They lived in Ephesus. This theoretically was this young man's girlfriend he was going to describe to me in a sexually inappropriate way. They were living in Ephesus. We're to be lights, and we're to make disciples. That's our job. That's our job. I can't see anyone's heart. I don't know who's saved. I don't know who really believe, believes in Christ. Okay? I do hope that the fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life. I do. Don't you hope that people, the fruit of the Spirit is evident in people's lives, that you can see love in there and all the things that happen? Self-examination demands a question be answered. Is the fruit of repentance in my life? Are the fruits of the Spirit evident? The fruits of the Spirit are love. It always starts off with love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't you wish sometimes you had a little bit more self-control? It's available. Turns out we're having a sale on self-control today. Against such, there's no law. All these are available to us as you look at them. They're up here. I know I'm looking at them there. You're doing these things. Get you crazy, you know? Mark will probably put some more things over here. He'll really mess me up. He's against me, that guy, Mark. But uh, communication makes things common, folks. Isn't that our mission? We're to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is anything but common. Yet we are to communicate that. The way to Jesus, it says in Matthew, the way to Jesus is narrow. It's narrow. It's hard. Few will find it. People need guides. People need lights. That's us. We're the guides. We're the lights. Communication conveys, to around, communication conveys to those around us what is inside us. What is inside us. Silence is an option. Because I have the light of Christ in me, I cannot hide it under a bushel. So this letter to this church, this church was embedded in a very dark, dark society. And... I started with this quote. I want to end with this quote. Words which do not give the light of Christ increase the darkness. Our words are so important. If our words are not increasing light, what are they for? What are they doing? They're increasing darkness. There's plenty of darkness around us. There really is. What's our job? Our job is to see that we do not have a failure to communicate. It's of the text that we've looked at, right? We should not have filthy and foolish speech, nor have coarse jesting. There's one bucket. The other one, are we a light or are we darkness? Wherever we go. We've been given such an incredible privilege, awesome privilege and opportunities. And it's Christmas on top of that. I Capitalize on this, folks. Capitalize on it. Take, take, take. It is such a great time to be able to reach out to people as lights. To them. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for this, this, this text, Lord. This is a hard text. It's an uncomfortable text, Lord, but it's from your word, and we need to be obedient to your word. I thank you so much for it. such a reminder. Let our lives be changed because of you, Lord. Let our lives reflect you. Let us be lights to this world that's around us. I thank you, Jesus, for this time that we have here. I thank you for all those who have come out today. And, and Lord, we always ask for blessings, Lord. But, Father, I believe us just coming here is such a great blessing. We have the privilege of coming out, coming to this place, and hearing the word of God in any form given. How great is that, Lord? We thank and we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
All right. So to, would it be lights, not darkness? Just, let's not make it hard, folks. It's not that hard to do. It really isn't. It really isn't. But I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad we have some visitors, people coming back, as they can see. We're not going to have Joanna for like two or three more weeks. She's in the Philippines. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? I think you know what happened. I'll say each week I'll call up someone and someone else have to come up here and help sing. What do you think of that? <laughs> That'll scare some of you. Yeah, that would be good. Well, what do you, I think, could we take up an offering, please? Could I get a couple of you gentlemen? Henry, would you please? And Joe, are you available? Are you available today, Joe? You are? Okay, good. Joe's available. These gentlemen will take up an offering for us this Christmas season. Joe, you, you have, Henry had to teach. You have to pray. How's that? Mm-hmm. 